Okay, can you just hear me out on this one? Now, I came across a fun fact about giant tarantulas that have supposedly domesticated dotted humming frogs. So if this happens in nature today, how common would it have been in the past? Seems like an odd topic when it comes to paleontology, but cohabiting relationships throughout Earth's natural history is a topic that scientists desperately want to study, but also one that is woefully underpreserved. But a lack of preservation does not mean something didn't exist. So something like symbiosis must have been relatively commonplace during the Mesozoic. For context of what got me thinking about this, the spider and frog relationship that I mentioned earlier is specifically between the Colombian lesser black tarantula along with possibly some species of Pamphobiteus, and the South American dotted humming frog, or Chiasmacleus ventrimaculata. These two guys, as it turns out, are the unlikeliest of friends, since the frogs have plenty to worry about from other spiders, and the tarantulas have a particular taste for many other species of frogs. But the frogs can not only be seen willingly going into the tarantula's lair, but actually following it around when the spider leaves its burrow. Even stranger, the tarantula will pay this species no heed, allowing these little guys to come and go as they please, but pouncing at the chance to attack and devour any other species of frog that ventures too close. The reason for this relationship is hypothesized to be mutually beneficial, since a tarantula can provide shelter, protection from other predators, and food from its leftovers, and the frog can provide another form of protection and cleaning service. These frogs are ant specialists. And it just so happens that ants are the biggest pests for these tarantulas. They're too small for the tarantula to purge from their burrows, but wreak havoc on the spider's precious eggs. The biggest mystery, however, is that these tarantulas often predate on very similar frog species, but aren't even known to attack these guys by mistake. So how this relationship came about and how they know not to attack or run away from each other is unknown. There are other examples of symbiosis which are either mutual or commensal. That is to say that one party neither benefits nor is harmed from the relationship. And these are all over the place. And a surprising amount of them actually provide some sort of domestic or cleaning or grooming service. But back to the matter at hand, how much of this existed back during the Mesozoic and with what dinosaurs? Again, there isn't a huge amount of this in the fossil record, but there is one instance that was described back in 2023. Amber from early Cretaceous deposits in Spain had preserved tiny beetle larvae surrounded by theropod feathers. These beetles were very similar to today's domestid, or carpet beetles, which are notorious pests that can feed on organic material that other animals find impossible to digest, such as hair or, funnily enough, feathers. The feathers within the amber show barb degradation associated with the feeding of these tiny beetles. But these were not likely parasitic like head lice since they appeared to have only fed on molted feathers. Now, it is of course likely that this was a commensal relationship that benefited the dinosaur in no way, shape or form, in which case I wouldn't count this in the thought experiment of mine, but it also might have benefited them. Molted feathers can really get in the way of things, especially if they're stopping a prospective mate from seeing that beautiful fresh plumage. So having something that keeps on top of it and only feeds on the weak and molted feathers without affecting the fresh goods would really come in handy. Alternatively, similar keratophagous bugs alive today are often found in bird nests and feed on the abundance of molted feathers from both the adults and juveniles, who are molting at a much higher rate being that they're going through their various feather stages. But if these bugs had similar defense strategies to today's counterparts, it's possible that these little bugs might have returned the favor. Many beetles, such as carpet beetles, have utilized their setae, which are arthropods equivalent of hair, in this case what is known as hastacetae. Essentially, they have small barbed spears that they can detach into other smaller predators, orienting themselves randomly and hopelessly entangling the attacker, such as ants or other insects. Since so many of these beetles make a home for themselves in these nests, these tiny detached barbs build up and felt together to form a mat within the nest. Now this can sometimes be a mild irritant for the vertebrate inhabitants, but it does add an extra layer of protection against intruders, and could even trap smaller animals for the juveniles to feed on in the case of these dinosaurs. But no direct evidence of this occurring within the fossil was found, though it does remain a possible speculation. As for other forms of symbiosis in non-avian dinosaurs, 
As is often the case, we can use the present as a window to look into the past. The first form of symbiosis that is widely common today, which I've already mentioned, is cleaning. This is where one larger animal, the client, will purposely place itself and adopt certain movements and behaviours to best accommodate the smaller animals, the cleaners, to do the job of cleaning it. Whilst we're not talking about the use of any lemon-scented scale polish or anything like that, the cleaners will address and eat various parasites that might be living off of and bothering the client, and maybe even detrital pieces of food within the mouth that would have otherwise turned rancid. In some cases, a cleaning station might not be necessary, and the relationship is more long-term, with the cleaners living part-time on the client or following them around as they go about their day. This way, the cleaners get protection from their predators as well as abundant and easy access to food whilst the client gets a nice spa treatment in which they can feel clean and refreshed and get those pesky itches scratched. As to how this may have shown itself in non-avian dinosaurs, there are plenty of possibilities. Larger theropods may have adopted this strategy in welcoming smaller detrital feeders to clean their mouths. Perhaps some animals that inhabited swampy or marshy environments, such as Dinochirus, were subject to wetland parasites like leeches, and keeping some smaller carnivores around next to them could help solve this issue. Many different forms of symbiosis may have also existed in the large herbivores as they do today. We see many large herbivores acting as part-time mobile home for small birds such as oxpeckers, which take advantage of a safe predator deterrent and food dispenser in return for addressing and eating various external parasites that might be bothering the animal, such as blood-sucking flies and ticks. Obviously, similar small birds may have existed back during the late Cretaceous, keeping large dinosaurs company for the very same reasons. But this kind of symbiotic niche likely extended to the more common small flies of the Mesozoic, pterosaurs. I have gone into more examples of small pterosaurs in my video on the group, but many of these were insectivores that would have greatly benefited from hanging out with some of these huge sauropods, and pretty much living as easy life as one can in the wild. But these kind of relationships can exist between two types of megafauna as well. In today's African savannas, zebras and giraffes have an interesting mutual relationship. It has only been relatively recently noted that herds of zebras seem to stick very close to giraffes for quite a specific reason. Giraffes have a pretty obvious skill in that they can see much greater distances than pretty much any ground-dwelling animal alive today thanks to their height. So zebras have taken fascinating advantage of this and actually learned how to read the body language of giraffes and can notice when the giraffes look distressed due to the presence of a predator. They then know to be vigilant and make a run for it at a moment's notice. This method also has a mutual benefit thanks to the zebra's sheer numbers, since a higher herd density will mean that each individual has a much higher chance of escape, even if those herd members are of a different species. Interspecies herding in dinosaurs is something I've long questioned, since despite how often it's portrayed in media, we don't actually know if it ever occurred. My hypothesis though is that it did, and the above example is one of the many potential reasons that it did. Herds of ornithopods may have taken full advantage of the taller sauropods and kept one eye open for any distress signals. Hell, there may have even been juvenile sauropods that become adopted. Sauropods are not known for their parental care and abandon their young at birth, opting for a quantity over quality approach similar to turtles. These young had to fend for themselves, and formed their own nursery herds for protection until they grew big enough to join the adults. Now, it is pure speculation, but it's possible that these nursery herds took advantage of the dense herds of other species, joining and following them around whilst not stepping on too many toes by eating slightly different vegetation. This would probably be a commensal relationship rather than mutual, since small juvenile sauropods probably couldn't bring much to the table, but a few additional numbers to the herd certainly wouldn't have hurt for the reasons I just mentioned. Plus, some animals have been known to form interspecies friendships. So the cold, callous, and dead inside heart in me that calls for some semblance of warmth hopes that the juvenile ornithopods and sauropods pulled a lamb before time. And if we really want to push the boats out, we could look at greater honey guides and humans. These birds have gotten their name because they will in fact lead humans and other honey-seeking animals to beehives for sitting back and letting the animal do all of the heavy lifting in extracting the honey and then taking their share. This form of leading to food sources that are too difficult for some to extract could extend endlessly during the Mesozoic, with smaller dinosaurs acting as sniffer dogs and leading the bigger ones who can exploit the find, be it a nest or otherwise. Now I know this is pure speculation, but the fun part of that is that this can be discussed endlessly. 
So I'm going to actually shut the hell up and let you guys discuss down below as to what kind of symbiosis you think might have occurred with non-avian dinosaurs, be it neutral or commensal. Whilst you're doing that, we are going to read today's questions, the first of which comes from PK Vela, uh, who has asked, external parasites are easy... Hi. Filming, but okay, sure. Um, external parasites are easy for grasp for me in terms of evolution, but how did internal parasites evolve? When was the first time that other creatures decided to live inside the host? And how internal parasites like worm? How did internal parasites like worms evolve? Did they evolve alongside fish and then took onto the land with their hosts? Or did they somehow evolve when animals like mammals were already land animals? Okay, this is actually one that I've never really stopped to think about before. So parasitism is something that has probably been a thing for as long as life has been a thing. And there are countless forms of it adopted by countless taxa across most phylums. Having said that, finding fossil evidence of this is very, very difficult. And as far as I'm aware, the earliest fossil evidence that we have of this is from the Permian. As to whether they started off internal, evolved to be internal, followed animals onto land, or evolved convergently after animals took to land, it's probably all of the above depending on what parasite we're talking about. Microscopic parasites that need water as a medium were likely always internal. But bigger parasites might have started out as external before burrowing their way into hosts further and further as they evolved. It's not exactly hard to do, especially when we have so many fossil shells that show signs of predation via tiny holes that were drilled into them. We even see really famous and gnarly examples such as with the tongue-eating louse that replaces a fish's tongue to eat the food for them. That example is an isopod, which is a clade that didn't evolve exclusively as parasites so it would have evolved to become internal after the fact. Tapeworms might be a similar scenario, becoming specialised parasites around 270 million years ago, but it's not known how or why they did this. Again, parasitism is something that has evolved multiple times across multiple phylums, with co-evolution with their hosts being a common rule of thumb, so it really does depend on what specific parasite we're talking about when it comes to answering this question. In fact, I would argue it is a big enough topic to justify its own video, so keep an eye out for that and thank you for the idea. Uh, our next one comes from Edge of Sanity 9111. How many ones did I just say there? I can't read today. Uh, what's your opinion on the placement of the early to late Cretaceous boundary? As of currently, this is placed at the Albion Cenomanian boundary but personally, I think it should be the cenomanian Turonian boundary. During the Cenomanian, we still see fauna similar to that of the Early Cretaceous. Hope you don't mind, but just, um, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read every single group, um, but you can read it on screen now. Um, since the Turonian, we see either the extinction or at least a great decline in the previously mentioned taxa. This extinction event and formal turnover would, in my opinion, represent a bigger change than seen in the Albion Cenomanian boundary. What are your thoughts on the matter? Oof. Uh, yeah, so for those who don't know, the Cretaceous is split into the early and late with no middle. Um, and the Albion stage is actually the last stage of the early Cretaceous um, and it proceeds to Cenomanian which is the first of the Lake Cretaceous. Uh, now you are right that the boundaries of geological times normally depend on what kind of fauna you find in each one. Um, and yeah, such a drastic faunal turnover should really justify the early and late boundary being moved. Um, but don't be so dependent on that. A uh, reason for that is because this is normally based on some sort of singular global occurrence since we can kind of narrow it down to within a few thousand years or so. Whilst I do agree that all of the formal turnover does show a stark enough difference to be the boundary, 
these turnovers are not close enough to each other chronologically or rich enough in information that we know exactly when these occurred. Instead, the boundary is defined by the first occurrence of the Foraminifera Retalopora globotrunconoides, as well as a sharp curve in the presence of the isotope Delta-13C. Now, I'm inclined to stick with this since it shows enough of a global change, but we can see it occur with a good amount of resolution. Whereas the formal changeovers that you spoke about would give too much of a vague number, the fossil record simply isn't complete enough for paleontologists to agree when exactly these occurred, at least with a margin of error of less than a million years. And that's if they all occurred within 200,000 or so years of each other. I do like the way that you're thinking, and with a bit more information, who knows, maybe that boundary could change. Anyway, thank you for submitting those, and thank you to everyone else that have watched this far. I hope you've enjoyed it enough to leave a like and a subscribe so that I can catch you guys next time.